Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Good evening, every person. And um, I celebrate all of you. Thank you for um, joining me today. Hallelujah. I'm excited. And I'm telling you, I'm a lover of people who love the word of God. When people, have, when people make up their minds to take charge of their own lives, I'm telling you, I love such people. And I'm excited about all of you. So good evening, everyone. I'm going to dive right into the word. But I, I salute everyone who, is, who has said good evening to me this evening. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise and ask you for revelation knowledge to dawn upon our hearts as we look into your word. I ask you for utterance, for thoughts to flow as you will through me to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, very quickly, an overview of what we've done so far. In order to change, in order to develop your life, in order to take your life to the next level, which is what Life Development Program is about, the first, there are five laws that we are trying to cover, that we are going to be covering. The first one is the law of faithfulness, and it's the law that says that blessed is the man who is found faithful, and to be faithful is to be found so doing. There is a plan for your life, there is a purpose for your life, and you must align with that plan and that purpose that is for your life. All right? We've looked at that, we've studied that, and the purpose of God for all of us is the gospel, is the mission of Jesus. And the second law is the law of the inner image, that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So your, your, um, the Bible says it in, in practically from, Gen from uh, uh, Genesis to Revelation, you will find something about this all through the Bible. So the Bible uh, uh, tells us that uh, in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20, it says, My son, give attention to my words, incline your ears to my sayings. He said, don't let them depart from your heart, keep them in the midst of your, in, uh, don't let them depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those that find them and hell to all their flesh. You know, so he says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Your life is determined by the state of your heart. And your state, the state of your heart is basically what are the things you perceive to be true? What are the things you accept to be true? Your belief system. All right. We've studied that extensively. And we said that there are three areas that you need to consciously work on your belief system. And you always work on any belief system by, by changing your association and changing the information flow to you. And we said the three areas you need to change your belief system and make sure you have the right image in you is that your image of God, your image of yourself, and your image of your future. All right. How far can you go? Your, your expectations for your future. All right. So in talking about this, we worked on the expectation, uh, um, the image you have of God. We said God is the God is is God the Father, not the Godfather. He is the all supply, no demand God. And we showed that God, the Jesus, is the reflection of the Father. And therefore, whatever Jesus is, however you see Jesus, this kind, loving, wanting to be a blessing person that he demonstrated throughout his stay on earth here. That is exactly the Father. For the Father is known. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And now we looked at that and we said the second thing you need to change, you need to make sure you have a right image of, is the image of yourself. And that's where, where we are. We began yesterday. And today, because it's about an, a change of image, I'm careful not to rush it and simply make sure I cover the material or cover what I want to say. But I want us to go scripture by scripture today. Um, some of the scriptures I just quoted, I want us to read them today. And I want you to allow the word of God to thoroughly speak to you. And as you are hearing them, let that image begin to change. We said that if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, God, God's idea of you what god thinks about you is the truth about you if god thinks that you are a, a um, good person then you are a good person 
if God thinks you're a bad person, you're a bad person. So what's God thought? Because God walks in truth. God cannot be lied to and he cannot lie. God cannot believe falsehood. And so whatever God believes to be true is the truth. And if God says you are righteous, then you are righteous. If God says that you are holy, then you are holy. Whether you feel holy or you don't. And that also means that uh, uh, um, humility now becomes accepting what God says. To be humble is not to deny yourself or, or depreciate your value or lower your value. No, that's not what humility is. Humility is not denying who you are. If I say I'm not a man, oh, I'm not a man, oh, I'm not a man, that's not humility. If God says you're a man, I, I should be humble enough to, act, to know that God knows better than me and therefore I accept what he says. It is pride to hear God say you are something and you think you know better. So having said all that, we began yesterday, we looked, we said every new creation, there are several things that are true about you. There are three things that you must understand and become how you see yourself. Number one, you are always righteous, regardless of what you do. Your righteousness was not because of what you did. You didn't earn it by what you did. You can't lose it by what you did. You didn't earn it by what you didn't do because that, 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 that you should not have done. Oh, I, I didn't kill anybody. That's why I'm righteous. No. So you can't lose it by what you didn't do. You got it as a gift. The Bible tells us very clearly, it says that he that knew no sin was made sin that you and I will be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we are made righteous. The Bible tells us that if by one man's trespass, death reigned through the one, then how much more will those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness? The moment you, you try to earn it, you lose it. All right? You do not, if you, you might try to earn it. If you are trying to earn righteousness, you no longer are operating in righteousness. So even though in the eyes of God you are righteous, you are no longer operating in righteousness. You have, like Paul called it, fallen from grace. In fact, let's, let's look at that verse of scripture. Like I said, last yesterday I quoted scriptures that we didn't um, look at. So I want you to look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You are following from grace. Let me read a simple translation. Um, for if, this is New Living Translation, for if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. This is, this is, <laughs> sounds crazy, all right? Because you see, what we've been told is that you fall from God's grace when you fall into sin. Oh, he fell from, from, from grace to grass, you know, because he did something he shouldn't have done. Oh, he fell from grace because he did something he shouldn't have done. But look at the scriptures. Now, like I said, humble enough to just accept the word. The scriptures say the person that has fallen from grace is not the person that fell into sin. Because the Bible tells us that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. In fact, grace abounds in that place where that person fell into that sin. Grace is abounding towards that person. If you miss the mark, if you fall into a sin, grace is abounding towards you to help you get back on track. Because that, that failure and that falling into that sin has consequences. That you don't want to stay in that. So grace abound towards, abounds towards you. And the Bible tells us that the grace of God trains us towards godliness. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. So the grace of God trains us to deny ungodliness. So grace abounds towards you to help you become more godly. So the person who fell into sin did not fall from grace. He fell into grace. 
Look at the person that fell from grace. It's the guy who is trying to be righteous by keeping the law. The guy who's, who is saying, oh, I, um, I, I want to be healed. But Father, I am asking for healing. But then he says to himself, have I been a good boy? Have I been a good girl? Have I been a good man? Have I been a good child of God? Have I, have I, have I kept the law? Have I been good? So he's trying to associate receiving what is by grace to whether he has been good. And because he's doing that, he's fallen from grace. Then he's wondering, how come I'm not healed? This person just, you know, just joined the church the last week. Very, I even saw him smoking, drinking. I saw him and look at him. He is healed. Look, this other person, you know, all of that, he's healed. I have been coming to it. I have been sweeping. I have been washing the plate. I have been doing everything. I have not lied. I have not cheated. I have not stolen. I have not done anything bad. And yet, I am the one who has not been healed. Have you noticed that's usually the case? Have you noticed that the first is usually the last and the last first? Jesus said it so. He said the guy who you think deserves it usually is the last to get it. And the one you think do not deserve it is only the first to get it. Why? Because it's by grace. And the guy who, who thinks, it, the things that qualify you are actually the things that disqualify you. May God help us see this. The things that qualify you are actually things that disqualify you. So those your merits are your demerits. And your demerits are your merits. That's why Paul said, I will rather glory in my infirmity. I will glory in my weakness so that the power of Christ will rest on me. So the guy who is looking at his, you know, his performance to be justified, to qualify, to be made right with God has fallen from grace. Not the guy who fell into sin. That one fell into grace. For where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Does sin have consequence? Yes. People have lost their marriages because of sin. People have lost their families, lost their respect of their, lost their reputation. Lost sin will steal from you. Still sin will lead to death, the manifestation of stealing, killing, and destruction. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I'm come that you might have life, indicating that death is stealing, killing, and destruction, and life is the opposite of that. All right, so let's let's let we these are things that we've already said, but I wanted to reiterate them. Glory be to God. So it's a gift. Righteousness is a gift and should be like every other gift received and thanks is given you are healed because of righteousness you have not done enough to be healed you have not done enough to prosper you have not done enough for any of those things so it's based on the fact that jesus gave you his righteousness all right so we read quite some scriptures on that and let me what i didn't deal with yesterday was the benefits of righteousness why we need to consciously embrace righteousness. Um, the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the hour of need. Do you know what makes for boldness? It is righteousness. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. So when you are righteous, you can come boldly. When you understand righteousness, you can come boldly. You know, do you know how many times people have gone to church, lifted their hands in worship and reverence, and then remembered something they did wrong, and then they lowered their hands. And they felt unworthy to worship God. They felt unworthy to even be in the midst of other believers. Do you know how many people have stayed home and didn't go to church because they felt unworthy? They, they were not, they didn't feel bold to come. To receive from God. Why? Because of a lack of sense, the understanding of righteousness. 
when you understand righteousness, you know that you are not approaching God on the premise of your performance, that you are approaching God on the premise of Jesus' performance, which has been credited to you. Now you've been made right as with God as a gift. And so you can come boldly to God, even when you sin. And I'm going to say that till somebody gets it. Because you see, if the reason why people backslide, there is, there is backsliding is an anomaly. Because God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't say, I will never leave you nor forsake you if you do not sin. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. As long as you have received Jesus, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, lo, I am with you always to the end of the earth. And so if he has never left you, how did you backslide? As you are sliding back, he's sliding with you. He's sliding with you. You slide, he slides. Because he said he will never leave you. So there is no such thing as backsliding. But there's, an exp there's such an experience. Even though there is no such reality, but there is such an experience. And the experience is because people do someone does something wrong, sins, and feels cut off from God, feels like he can't come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help. And so he just continues. The only option left for him now is just to continue in that sin. But when you understand that even when you just two seconds after you, in fact, while you are doing the sin, while you are doing it, if you lift your hands, heaven immediately is there with you. Heaven is immediately, you are the throne of grace immediately is available to you right while you are doing the same. And, and I, I pray that you will learn to maximize that. You will learn to right in the middle of the sin, lift your head to God and say, Father, this is crazy. What I'm doing here is stupid. But I thank you because you're my father. I thank you because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Therefore, sin has no power over me. You won't be able to finish it. You have to choose one or the other. You won't be able to finish that sin. And if you, did, if you, if you didn't do all that and you, you committed the sin, the next second, you can come boldly. Because you see, without him, you can do nothing. Without him, you will simply continue in that pattern of sin. Righteousness makes you able to come boldly. The consciousness of righteousness makes you able to come boldly. The righteous are as bold as a lion. You can believe God when you understand righteousness, regardless of your sin. All this, I'm trying to believe for healing. I'm trying to believe for this. And then you remember something you did wrong and you are wondering if God is going to show up this time. You can believe God regardless of your sin. The Bible says, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. Because God will never impute sin. Romans 4 verse 7 to 8. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. God is not imputing sin to you because you are righteous. Your sin has consequence for you on this earth, but not with God. God is not imputing sin to you. This is powerful. When you understand this, you can come to God in spite of your sin. And because you keep coming to him, you find the strength to not continue in sin. You see, because the nature, some say, Pastor, no, when you say this, you are, you, you are now saying we should go ahead and be sinning. If I tell you that if you throw up, vomit, it doesn't matter. Now, you are going to experience the shame. You're going to soil your clothes. You're going to be embarrassed. You're going to lose your reputation. But with me, it doesn't, I have, I have dealt with that already. If I said that to you, does that make you throw up every two, two seconds? Does that make you just somehow cook up throwing up? No. You know why? You don't have a nature to throw up regularly. Throwing up is contrary to your nature. Sin is contrary to the nature of the believer because the Bible says he that is born of God cannot sin for the seed of God remains in him. 
the seed of God, the nature of God, the DNA of God remains in that person and he cannot sin. So understand why we don't continue in sin. It's not because uh, uh, um, we are afraid of God slapping us from heaven. No, not only were we made righteous, our nature was changed. We were, we were given the divine life. That was the second thing we looked at yesterday. We were given the life of God, the very life of God. What makes God God? God, let me ask you a question. Who deals with God if he sins? Who has ever slapped God? Say, God, if you ever sin, I will slap you. Who? Who is able to in all this universe? So how come God doesn't sin? You see, we make it look like we have a nature to sin and somebody has to stop us from sinning. No, you have the nature of God now. You have the divine nature. You have the life of God. And so the same way God, even though there is nobody above him who is threatening him if he sins, yet he has never sinned. Why? It's not his nature. Look at you as a human being. Nobody has threatened you. If you ever go and eat your own poo-poo, if you ever eat it, I will deal with you. Is that why you have not been eating your poo-poo? Is that why you have not been consuming, serving to yourself? <laughs> Praise God. It's disgusting. I, I feel disgusted just talking about it. Some of you are like, urgh, urgh, right now. Why? It's not your nature. It's not your nature. You need to understand that sin is not your nature. But if you fall into sin, his grace abounds towards you. If you fall into sin, you don't, it doesn't change your righteousness, but it's not your nature. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? He didn't say, no, we shall not. He said, how shall we? It was a nature issue. It's like, so he didn't say, no, we shall not continue in sin. No, he said, how shall we that are dead to sin? How shall we? Did you get that? So it's not our nature. How, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Someone says, oh, I want you to fly. How shall we? How? How? We're asking how. It means that's not our nature. All right. Glory be to God. Benefits of this righteousness. Another thing is this. You can claim the blessing because it is now on the premise of righteousness. You can now claim the blessing regardless of your errors and mistakes and sin. Now, people who have a problem with the message of righteousness and they think, oh, you know, you're telling people, uh, um, you are giving people license to sin. People have a problem with that. I have a problem with their, with them. Okay, let me say it that way. Let me show you one of the problems. If you don't embrace righteousness, let me show you one of your major problems. Deuteronomy. It means you cannot claim any blessing whatsoever. Let me read you Deuteronomy 28. The one you we normally quote, I'm blessed coming out, blessed going in. You are not blessed unless on the premise of righteousness because there is a condition attached. Have you read that condition? So let's read Deuteronomy 28 from verse 1. It says, if you fully obey the Lord your God. Do you know what fully means? Fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. Think about this. If you fully obey and keep all. Okay, so that's the condition. It's not that you partially obey, not that you kept majority of it, not that you tried your best, not that you wanted to keep it. If you kept it fully, not that what you didn't fail in one. Now, I want you to point somebody out to me who never failed in one. Point one person to me. That means you that you are claiming this and saying, I'm, I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed coming in. My, 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 my storehouse is blessed. You have no business claiming it. The only way you can experience this is on the premise of righteousness. 
That's why the Bible says, remember? Romans chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Blessed. There is now a blessing. The blessing is no longer running on if you shall keep fully. It's running on this. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. That's what the blessing runs on in the new covenant now. It runs on the fact that God has made you righteous and will not impute sin. It doesn't run on if you are able to keep all. You see, because Jesus came. That's why the Bible says he that knew no sin was made sin. So that we may be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus that knew no sin. Jesus came and he kept all. All the commandments. He kept, Jesus is the only person that has walked this earth that kept, that met this condition, fully obeyed, kept all the commandments. He did it so well that God showed up in the river Jordan and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Did it so well that God showed up at the transfiguration mountain and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Oh boy. Jesus now says, the Bible tells us that the, the, by the obedience of one man, many are now qualified. Many are made righteous. So you and I, by the obedience of Jesus. So when you read this and the devil tells you, you have not fully obeyed. You say, yes, yes, you agree. You have not kept all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I've not kept all. And you say, but Jesus did. And so this is how you read it. Because Jesus has fully obeyed the Lord his God. And kept all the commands of God that was given. And has given me his righteousness. Oh boy. Therefore, the Lord is setting me on high above all the nations of the earth. I will experience all these blessings. Glory be to God because of Jesus. And then let your heart rise up in worship to him. And celebrate him. And you now understand why tears fill our eyes when we say thank you Jesus. When white tears fill our eyes and we sing songs about him. Some folks may ask me. Some folks may say, Who is this Jesus you talk about? Every day he is my savior. He set me free. Now listen as I tell you what he means to me. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me. Made everything new. Hear me as I tell you what he means to me. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. No one has ever been loved like we've been loved, folks. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. So now, because of righteousness, you can claim the blessings. You don't have to have measured up to a particular standard. Jesus measured up to the standard. You don't even have to lower the standard to where you can say, okay, yeah, I did 30%. 30% is not enough. But Jesus made 100 and he gave you that as a gift. Finished it. Take. Use it anytime. <laughs> it's called righteousness, folks. The benefits of righteousness, the benefits, glory to God. One of the benefits is in Isaiah 32 verse 17. It says, and this righteousness will bring peace. Yes, it will bring quietness and confidence forever. This righteousness will bring peace. It will bring quietness and confidence. One of the benefits of righteousness is, first of all, peace. Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. See that scripture again. Being justified, being made righteous by faith. We have peace with God. This fear, 
that God is maybe against you, that God may not work for you this time. This interview you are going for may not work because you did something here, because you did something there. Believers have lived in more fear than unbelievers because they are afraid. They've been told rules and regulations and laws and, and they now expect trouble because they have not been able to measure up. A lot of believers think that what they are going through, God is the one that is against them. And, and I, I say to myself, have you read the scriptures? Have you read the word of God? Have you read what the Bible says? <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. I need to get a scripture out. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Have you read the scriptures? I wanted to, I wanted to get the scripture out here, but because of time. You know, said they shall surely gather, but not by me. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And the tongues against you in judgment you shall condemn. Have you, have you read that? You see, when you understand justification by faith, you believe you are justified. And the fear is gone. And the troubling is gone. Now there is peace. God is always on my side. God is always for me. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him so that I can be righteous, he will, how shall he not with him also freely give me the interview and give me all things? If while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. Think about these things. These are scriptures. If while I was a sinner, Christ died for me, how much more now will I be saved, the Bible says, by his life? In fact, let's get that one out. Oh, hallelujah. Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son Jesus, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Think about it. When Jesus paid for you and gave his life for you, you were his, you were his tax sinner. You were sinning more then. Yet he gave his life. So now that you are now born again, he's going to check every little thing you do. Now, don't get me wrong. Those things you do have their consequence in your life. Just like if you soil your clothes, if you eat your own uh, uh, excrement, it, will, it affects you, but it's not your nature. And if it ever happens, it does not stop God from loving you. It does not stop God. It does not disturb your righteousness. You can come boldly to God. Just like we will go to the doctor when we are sick. This, this sickness and sin are very related. Saying, oh, let us sin. Let us sin so that grace may abound. It's like saying, let us be sick so that medicine can work. No. Can you? Did you get that? But if you do fall sick, the medicine works. But you're not going to go fall sick so that medicine can work. Can you see that? And if you keep on falling sick, you keep on destroying your body, right? So there's a consequence to that sickness. But medicine will not say, oh, I worked for you last week. I worked for you two weeks ago. I worked for you three weeks ago. I worked for you four weeks ago. This week, I am going to let you see. I'm not going to work for you. The medicine will always work. Glory be to God. All right, let's, let's move faster. So one of the benefits of righteousness is that it brings peace. The, the, and this righteousness will bring peace. Just this assurance inside of you. And it calls it quietness and confidence. That's why the righteous are as bold as a lion. It brings confidence. We believe unto righteousness. All right. Lastly, one of the benefits of righteousness is in prayer. The Bible says the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. That is dynamic in its working. So as a righteous person, your prayer is now astronomically powerful. 
when you pray effectively and fervently. That's why the devil will try to keep you from praying. He'll, try, he'll tell you, just pray some two minutes and move on. He'll try to keep you from praying effectively and fervently. Because he knows you have, he can't change the fact that you have now been made righteous. He doesn't mind you praying if you are not being made righteous. Because the prayer of an, an unrighteous man is an abomination to God. He doesn't mind you praying hours. But the moment you have been made righteous and you understand your right standing with God, he begins to encourage you to just do one minute, 30 seconds. Just say, oh Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, and then move on. He doesn't want you to join in on a rise like we're going to do tomorrow morning and speak in tongues and pray fervently. He tells you, oh, you don't need to do all that. You don't need to pray fervently. Just pray gently. Oh, Father God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, bless my mother, bless my father, bless my people, bless my sons, bless my daughters, bless us all. We honor you. Yes, Lord. And you watch TV. He doesn't mind you doing that. Because if, if you get to pray as a righteous man, it availeth much. It accomplishes much. It shakes nations. It destroys the enemy. But because of righteousness. The second thing we talked about yesterday that I want to reestablish inside of you strongly is the fact that the new creation, this person that has given his life to Christ, this the image you must have of yourself. One is that you're always righteous. Two is that you have the life of God in you. You have the life of God in you. You have the very nature of God. You ought to sing that song as often as you can. I've got the life of God in me. I've said that so many times when sickness tried to ravage my body. I've got the life of God in me. I've got the spirit of the son of God. I've got the life of God in me. Hallelujah. Every cell of my body, every system, every tissue, every organ of my body is flowing in the life of God. Is submerged in the life of God. Sickness cannot stay in this body. I tell my body that regularly. And I've worked in divine health for since 1995. That's 26 years now. The word works, folks. So let's look at this. Let's look at scriptures. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the purpose of Jesus coming was so that he can have eternal life. So say, but he was to make us righteous. Yes, he made us righteous so that we can now be qualified for eternal life. Jesus made us righteous because he wants us to have life. Life is ultimately the goal of righteousness. Right, life, righteousness now allows you to have life. Life is not, the life of God is destructive to sin and anything unworthy. So he made you worthy. Then he gave you his life. Let me, let me show you the scriptures. Romans 8 and verse 10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Do you get that? So the, the spirit in you releases life. Life is flowing. That spirit itself is a manifestation of life because of righteousness. So the ultimate goal of the coming of Jesus is to impart into human vessels the divine life. Somebody say out loud. Say it very boldly. I have the life of God in me. Oh, hallelujah. Say it again. Say, I have the life of God in me. If I type it in there, I have the life of God in me. Put your names there. Say, Noel Manufo has the life of God in him. Put your own name. Jesus attested to that when he said in John 5 verse 26, as the father had life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life. There was something about this. He was talking to people that were alive. 
He was talking to people that were breathing. And he was talking about life like it was something they didn't have that they should have. As the father had life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life. You guys don't have it. You don't have what we're talking about here. It's not this life yeah, you guys are talking about, the bios. No, it's the way. It's the way. It's the divine life. It's not the bios you got your biology from. It's the divine life. It's the way. As the father had life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life. And then he says in John 10, verse 10, I am come that you might have that life as well. Just like there is a human life, there is a divine life. The same way the human life is the nature of the human, the divine life is the nature of God. 1 John 1 and verse 3 says how what great love the father has bestowed on us that we are called the sons of god what he's talking about is still this life he's saying that you and i now have the nature of god you and i now have the life of god you and i now have the divine nature the same way by giving birth to my son my wife you know bringing my son into this world who has my seed i have given i've imparted to him the human nature in the natural by being born, that is when he got born the first time. By being born again, this time around now by the Spirit. The Spirit now is the one who birthed you when you got born again. And the same way the first birth by your mother and your father brought you into the natural life, the human life. The birth by the Spirit of God has brought you into the divine life. You are born again into a divine life, a higher level of life. That's why you need to know how that level of life functions. That level of life has a way it, 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 a way it handles finances. Just like human beings have a way they handle finances. <laughs> Glory to God. That dogs don't bother with. That, that monkeys don't bother with. There is a way that this divine life operates when it comes to finances. There's a way when, they, when he wants to receive, this divine life will give. For God so loved. Bible says God desired to have sons. Many sons unto glory. He made the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He gave Jesus so that he can have you and I. He gave Jesus so that he can have us. That's how that divine life functions. You need to now learn how it functions, how it operates, and begin to function in it. And stop bothering yourself about those who don't have the divine life. Don't say, oh, you know, I know people are not born again, and they are still making it financially. Well, the psalmist said so in Psalm 73. He said, I was almost moved. I almost slipped because I was looking at the unbelievers and I saw that they were also prospering. The wicked were prospering. He said, and I saw their end. Folks, it's not just about the money they made. It's about where they are headed. And that's not where you are headed. This is divine life. It's not heading in that direction. So when we talk about the divine life, we're talking about what makes God, God. What makes God, God. In fact, that's actually the definition of godliness. You see, godliness is not just holiness. Godliness is functioning like God. Godliness includes a godly person, biblical godliness. If I say manly, you say like man. If I say um, what otherly, um, hourly, every hour. So if I say godly, why is that different? Godly is like God. And like God, God does not tolerate sickness in his body. It's ungodly. It's not like God to live in sickness. It's not like God to live in poverty. It's not like God to live in sin. It's ungodly to live in sin. It's ungodly to live in poverty. It's ungodly to live in sickness and disease. It's ungodly to live in bitterness and strife. It's ungodly to be frowning and say, where are you frowning? Say, I don't even know. I, this guy, I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry. I'm, you know, I'm going to destroy and kill. Eh? That's ungodly. Anything that is not like God is ungodly. What makes God, God, is this divine life. And that's what he has, been, he has imparted into you. Now you have it. The Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Let's just read these verses of scripture and close first john chapter 4 verse 17 herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is 
so are we in this world. As Jesus is, not as he will be, as he is, so are we in this world. Why? Because you have the divine life. Because you have the divine life that he has. The Bible says in, let's read another verse of scripture, that he's not ashamed to call you brethren. Hebrews 2 and verse 11. For both he that sanctifies, that's Jesus, and they who are sanctified, that's you and I, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. That word brethren is the Hebrew, the Greek word adelphos, where you get adolphos from. And it means from the same womb. Let me read you the complete word uh, study Bible dictionary. Let me read it verbatim, all right? It says, Adolphus generally denotes, watch this, a fellowship of life. That means unity of life from the same life. Fellowship of life based on identity of origin. Oh boy. Can it be clearer than that? That Jesus is saying, the Bible says Jesus is not ashamed to say you and I share the same life and we come from the same place. We were sourced from the same place. We came, we share the same life. You see why? These are the consciousnesses. These are the, this is the consciousness that cannot permit sickness in your body. This is the consciousness that you get, the inner image you get. And sickness cannot stay in your body. You know, somebody heard me say this one day. I said, why would he stay in my body? Is he born again? And the said, he never heard that before. But that's the way I'm thinking. I didn't plan to say that. But that's the way it came out of me because of a consciousness. I am the one born again. This sickness is not born again. I have the divine life. I am sourced from the same place as Jesus. We have an identity of origin. We have a fellowship of life. As he is, so am I. The life in him is the life in me. And if he can't be sick, I can't. Mapa ribo ghost of And someone said, what about what's going on in my body? Then I talk to it. I tell it in the name of Jesus, you cannot stay. I have the life of God in me. Go! And it has to go. And so I said, what if it doesn't go that day? I'm not going to stop. Sincerely, there's, there's some things you know and you are conscious of and you never stop. You can't stop. If you woke up one morning and you're a man, you know you're a man, or your brother, if you're a lady, woke up one morning and then the stomach was bulging. He knows he's a man. You know he's a man. His stomach is bulging. Or you're a man yourself, your stomach is bulging. And then, what's going to happen? Are you going to like... Uh, you say, oh, no, something is wrong here. Someone says, oh, you are pregnant. I say, what? Me? Pregnant? I'm a man. I have, I have the human life, quote and unquote. So man, men don't get pregnant. I cannot be pregnant. And then, so what are you going to do? Because the, that, throughout that day, the stomach was still bulging. What are you going to do? You will do something about it. You're going to walk. You're going to go see someone. You're going to go to the hospital. You're going to do all kinds of stuff. Because it's just human, men's stomach don't bulge. Eh? And watch this. And if the one week later, the stomach is still bulging, are you ever going to get to a point where you go, maybe it's pregnancy. You will never get to where you accept that fact. It cannot be. Well, there's a way you can, you can come into the consciousness of this life where you cannot accept certain things. It can't be. And you will keep talking to it. You will keep speaking to it. You will not be discouraged because you know that the life of God is in you and it destroys everything that has to do with stealing, killing, and destruction. Let's run through this quickly. Oh boy. I can talk about this for, for hours upon hours upon hours. Hallelujah. Let me close with this. One of the benefits of this life 
is the fact that the life of God in you, this life is synonymous with the blessing. This life is actually the fullness of the blessing. You should never look at Abraham and wish you were him. Because Abraham looked ahead, the Bible tells us, at our time and wished he was us. So maybe you need to figure out what exactly you are. Because if the one that Abraham was looking ahead, the Bible says they saw us. They couldn't be made perfect without us. They saw us, Hebrews chapter 11, afar off, and they rejoiced that they were able to see us. That they were able to behold, yea, see these people, oh. And they rejoiced at the privilege of knowing about us. You cannot now be one of us and be wishing you were Abraham. Why? Because they, ah, because they had the blessing of Abraham. That's good. That blessing was an amazing thing. That blessing wrecked havoc to the enemy in his day and prospered him crazily. But do you know the truth? This life is the fullness of the blessing. Let me, let, let, let's prove that. In Genesis, God said to man, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. The day you eat it. Adam didn't die that day, but he lost the blessing. What happened that day was this. God showed up and said, the ground is now cursed because of you. Adam lost the blessing. So when God told him that day you will die, he was talking about losing the blessing. So death is the loss of the blessing. Death is the curse. Life is the blessing. Well, you said that's not enough for me. Well, Psalm 133, the Bible says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. It's like the, the oil that runs down Aaron's birds all the way it goes on to the garment. And then in the last verse, verse 3, it says, For therein the Lord has commanded the blessing even life, very verbatim, the blessing, even life forevermore, life for eternal, eternal life is the blessing. If that's not enough for you, Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 says, God was speaking to the children of Israel, said, when he gave them the commandment, said, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life, life and death, blessing and cursing, life is the blessing, death is the cursing. Just like in Genesis. If that's not enough for you, here's the clincher. Jesus comes in John 10 and verse 10. He says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but I'm come that you might have life and have it abundantly. If you didn't know what this life is, you know that it is something that stops the killing, the stealing, and the destruction. It's like saying the, the, the wind is blowing so much cold your way, but I have this jacket for you. If you don't know what a jacket is, if you've never seen one before, you've never heard that word before, you immediately understand that whatever it is, it's something that shields or keeps from the cold. The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The life of God is the, the enemy of, this, of, the, of the stealing, the killing, and the destruction, the death that the, that the enemy brings. The life of God is what negates it. That's, the, that's the, one of the powerful things about this life. And the Bible says that you and I are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Why? Because we have this life. Because we have this life. You have the life of God in you. It's no longer just that you are blessed. It is now that you are the blesser. Oh boy. Let me ask you a question. Is God blessed? <laughs> Something to think about, right? Is God blessed or he is the blesser? So, if you, are, if you, that there's a problem there. If you are saying, does God have the blessing? Yes, he does. But who blessed him? No one. Because he didn't need to be blessed. Why? He has the eternal life. Eternal life is the fullness of the blessing. And that's exactly who he is. God has that life. The divine nature is the blessing. The divine nature is the fullness of the blessing. Someone can bless you for prosperity and increase. Someone can, can, you can, someone can bless another person for protection, bless them. But when you talk about the divine life, it's not prosperity or It's the totality of, the, of all that God is and can do that has been deposited and given to you. 
And when you understand that, it's no longer about, I need this person, I need that blessing. Now, you are the one now, just like the Father, like God himself, is the one that blesses. You are now a blesser. So you are already blessed. You, the, the, that life makes you a blessed, but now you are a blessing. You're not just blessed, now you're a blessing. You are the blessing. When you go to work somewhere, that office, they may not know it. And it may not have been happening because you have not been walking in the light of it. But when you go to work in an office, that office is blessed now because the blesser, a blessing came in there. The one with the capacity. You are carrying life. When you release a little bit of it, they, they call it blessing. You take a little bit of that like, they say, oh, we are, we are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. But you are the drum of it. You spread it somewhere. They, 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 they experienced the, 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 the fragrance of it, of that life. And they say, we are blessed. But you are not just blessed. Are you blessed? Yes. But you are not just blessed. You are the drum of the blessing, the, the, the pot of blessing, because you carry the life of God. You see why you cannot be afraid somebody cursed you? Oh, somebody took my name somewhere. Somebody did this. Somebody did that. Are you kidding me? Are they born again? You have the life of God in you. The thing about this life, let me close with this. Some say, well, Pastor Noli, these things are true. How come I've not been experiencing it? Paul told Timothy, and this is, this is critical. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, Fight the good fight of faith, verse 12. Lay hold on eternal life. He said, the life of God that is in you, you need to lay hold of it. And you do that by faith. You fight the fight of faith. You refuse to believe contrary. You stay in the conviction of that life. And you talk with the conviction of that life. You refuse to speak contrary. You refuse to believe anything to the contrary. Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. And by doing that, lay hold on eternal life. This life that you have, you need to lay hold of it and use it. To, for, to bring manifestation, you need to use it. You need to lay hold on it. A lot of you looking at me, you have knives in your house. You have knives in your homes. Am I correct? Does that mean if I throw bread into your house, the bread will just be sliced? If I throw unsliced bread into your house, will it become sliced? No. Somebody has to lay hold on the knife and slice the bread. You have the life of God in you. But sickness can still stay in your body. Someone has to lay hold on that life and drive out the sickness. And you do that by faith. What does that mean? You believe and you speak. You believe and you speak and you refuse to believe otherwise and you speak with conviction. You speak, that conviction can, can show up as anger. It can show up as joy. It can show up if there's sickness in my body and I'm speaking with conviction, there's an anger. It, I didn't decide to be angry, but I'm angry. What are you doing here? I'm talking to the thing. What are you doing? Here? Get out of my body. That, that conviction can show up as joy. When I'm dancing and rejoicing because I know that I know that I know, it is done. You speak with conviction. Declarations with conviction is how you exercise your faith. It's how you fight the good fight of faith. And when you do that, you lay hold on eternal life. In any area that you're speaking, you speak to your finances, you're speaking life. You speak to your marriage, you're speaking life. You speak to your body, you're speaking life. Once you believe it in your heart and you say, it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I, I believe this blessed you. Father, we thank you for your word today. We receive it with thanksgiving. And I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice will go forth living out these truths in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining in today. I look forward to have you join me tomorrow morning as we pray intensely and continue on the seven keys to increasing your income. And then tomorrow evening, I'll continue with the laws that govern life. We're going to look at another law. Till then, remember you are, you are tremendously loved by God and unconditionally loved. And because of that, you will experience his wisdom, his power and favor as you continue to live in the consciousness of that love. Have a wonderful night. In Jesus' name, amen.